Hello again, and welcome to Session 2, Part A of this five-session series. Last time, we reviewed Black American history from the Civil War to the early 20th century. The overriding theme was that over 200 years of prejudice was codified by the Supreme Court in the Jared Scott decision. The philosophy expressed in that decision was that Black people were inferior, uneducable, lazy, and lacked initiative. Even though Dred Scott was overturned, the philosophy behind it was applied time and again by the Supreme Court and the presidency to undercut the intentions of the wartime amendments and the efforts of Reconstruction. The corollary to this theme was that Black Americans were invisible. Decisions about them were made without them. In this session, we will see how these themes continue as they are manifest in zoning, housing, and access to the beaches. My presentation is informed by my work with desegregatect.org, Guilford's Planning and Zoning Commission, and Guilford's Housing Committee, along with ongoing seminars with the Affordable Housing Working Group of the South Central Regional Council of Governments. The council includes, among others, New Haven, Bramford, and Guilford, in Madison, which will be highlighted in this talk. By the end of this discussion, you should be able to explain how zoning and real estate laws led to segregation, explain how the effects of history are sustained today, and discuss innovative ideas for urban renewal and zoning reform. The plan of the lecture will be to tell a story about preserving a neighborhood in New Haven and how Guilford was involved, zoning and development of the suburbs. Then we'll discuss how zoning sustains racial segregation. In part B, I'll tell a story about the Connecticut beaches. And we'll talk about current efforts nationally and in Connecticut to ameliorate the effects of systemic racism. This story takes place in the Dixwell and New Hallville neighborhoods of New Haven. Now you might recognize here is uh, Yale University and here is Dixwell Avenue running like this in Goff Street. And you'll notice the Winchester Ar Repeating Arms Company Historic District. The Winchester uh, factory plays in a prominent part in this story. Below it, is the Dixwell neighborhood, and just above it is the Newhallville uh, neighborhood. I did some research in the historical room of the Guilford Library with the help of Tracy Tomaselli. She introduced me to a gentleman who lived in Dixwell in the 60s and also spent some time in Guilford. When he was about 12 years old, his father took him to Guilford to buy a country club. Here is the story. During World War II, the demand placed upon wartime industries across the nation forced them to end discriminatory hiring practices and begin hiring Black Americans. Winchester recruited workers from the South who migrated into New Hallville, the domain of European immigrants. The Europeans were not happy about this. Nonetheless, Edwin Williams grew up in the 60s and remembers a solid working class neighborhood with many black and white businesses. Economically, it was a self-sufficient neighborhood that provided an amical venue for famous black jazz musicians. However, after the war, uh, World War II and Korean Wars, Winchester did not adapt to a peacetime economy and slowly closed down. The loss of work combined with racism, the GI Bill, and construction of I-95 led to white flight. Efforts were made to instill community pride and clean up the neighborhood. One of these efforts uh, was the Freddie Fixer Parade, named after Dr. Frederick Smith a pediatrician in the community, 
And that parade continued up into through the uh, COVID pandemic. The idea was to uh, clean up vacant lots, fix up uh, properties where that could be done, help the elderly maintain their properties, uh, keep a good looking neighborhood to keep the property values up. Another thing uh, that was done to instill community pride was to establish a summer camp on Lake Quanapog. Now you rec might recognize in this picture, uh, the beach at Lake, uh, Lake Quanapog. it's a town beach. And uh, there was a fellow named Dave Dinwoody who ran a social club on the site and he wanted to sell it to Guilford um, and the Board of Selectmen thought, oh, this is a great idea. We could build a beach here. But the Board of Finance said, no, there's too much work. Route 77 is very dangerous. There are no fences along the side. The beach is too small and it would just take too much uh, effort. So along came this consortium from New Haven and uh, Dinwoody was interested to lease the property. Now, <clears throat> this is remarkable that Guilford let this happen because uh, most like associations in Connecticut would not allow black people to swim in their lake. Just the black skin touching the water would uh, pollute it. But Guilford had a different mind. Um, they supported the camp with volunteer labor uh, and fundraisers. You can see uh, advertisements in the Shoreline Times for uh, a dance in the uh, social club. With the volunteer labor and fundraisers, uh, the camp was uh, set up. If you visit the lake, uh, you'll notice uh, across the street from the beach is a parking lot and up the hill there's a pavilion uh, in a cleared uh, grassy area. That was the site of Dinwiddie's social club. Well, to expand the beach, uh, Guilford was able to do that, uh, and uh, but they owned that expanded beach. And so they leased it uh, uh, to the summer camp. The day camp included 100 neighborhood uh, kids from, uh, from New Haven and 50 Guilford children. Uh, and uh, this was for each of eight two-week sessions. After two years, the camp was lost to foreclosure. It seems there was a drowning on the lake and a lawsuit and while um, we're not 100% clear that that's what caused the uh, camp to fold, uh, in any event, after two years, uh, Dinwoody uh, foreclosed on his lease. Despite these efforts of the camp and the Freddie Fixit Parade, um, the neighborhoods uh, continued to decline. The original intent of zoning was to protect residential uh, areas from industry, but it didn't quite work out that well. This is a map of uh, 1913. You might recognize New Haven uh, Harbor. Yale University was located here more or less. Here is Dixwell Avenue, and here is Gulf Street. And the dots represented where uh, families lived, of the people who worked in the factory. I think each dot is uh, five families. And you can see that they're mostly clustered around the Winchester factory, which was located here. Here's the Dixwell neighborhood. Here is the New Hallville neighborhood. And so people wanted to work close to where, uh, wanted to live close to where they worked. And so they were clustered around the industrial campus. Zoning was invented in New York City in the 20s to uh, protect the residential areas from industry, but it was frustrated by this very fact. Instead of health, zoning developed into a tool for protecting wealth. We need to consider, how did zoning become a tool for segregation? What hindered black families from accumulating generational wealth? Because these are two intertwined questions. We also need to consider uh, systemic effects of the New Deal and the GI Bill. Social Security, uh, a New Deal uh, program, was denied to farmers and domestic workers. This was a concession to 
uh, uh, the Southerners to gain Southern votes. Why? Because most black people were farmers or domestic workers. The fear was that black Americans would become dependent on social programs and health care. You may recall these arguments were used to limit the 14th Amendment. And it follows the philosophy behind the Dred Scott decision of the Supreme Court, this idea that blacks, but not white Americans, black Americans would become dependent if we gave them a program like Social Security. This also hurt a larger portion of poor whites, as a percentage of the white population, the few were poor, but a low percentage of a large number is still a pretty large number. And so these policies hurt poor white Americans even more than they hurt black Americans. And you would think that all the poor should be allies, but white Americans were prejudiced against black Americans and the um, wealthy, the politically powerful, use this prejudice to drive a wedge between what should have been uh, natural allies. The same scenario was repeated when Republican states re rejected the expansion of Medicaid. It hurt blacks most, but it hurt a lot of whites as well. Expanding uh, this ability to reject Medicaid was made possible by a SCOTUS decision on Obamacare. This is an example of using non-racist language to achieve the same end. Now the GI Bill comes into play because together with the interstate highway system, veterans could leave the city neighborhoods to move to the suburbs. Black veterans, however, were largely excluded. And this led to white flight from the Dixwell and New Hallville neighborhoods. Let's use Guilford to uh, illustrate the effects of the GI Bill. This graph shows the growth of Guilford and the growth of uh, the high school population. And what we see in the period following uh, World War II and the Korean War, there is an exponential growth in the population of Guilford. And following more or less 10 year lag, there is a growth in the population of the Guilford High School. Now to understand this graph a little better, to get all the data on the same graph, I had to divide the population by 10. So 2000 on this graph means 20,000 for the Guilford population at this time. For the high school population, 1000 means 1000. So you can see the exponential rise in the population of the high school following this 10 year lag, well, that would make sense if a lot of young families were moving in at this time and their children were grow growing up uh, to be in the high school. But we noticed the growth of the town uh, slowed down and so did the uh, school enrollment. Even though there was an increase here, it suggests that we are now in an aging population. We're past the age of school children. So the size of the school is, uh, has been pretty steady since uh, 1980. The rest of this graph I'm going to uh, use in the last session where we talk about education. In various towns, covenants, intimidation, and violence uh, that was sanctioned by the police would keep black homeowners out. This was the time of Levittown, suburban communities with deed restrictions that said you can never sell your house to a black individual. But if black individuals did, they were uh, subjected to violence, harassment, protests at the realtors. In fact, um, when there was physical violence at a black home, uh, the police stood by and let it happen. Now we have no evidence of covenants in Guilford. The town historian, Joe Hellander, suggested to me one neighborhood near the Madison border uh, might have had covenants, uh, but I haven't had the uh, uh, time to look up and uh, explore that possibility. You may know the movie, Raisin in the Sun. It's about a black family that comes into a windfall and the whole movie is about how to spend the money. 
the matriarch of the family has the dream of moving to a house in the suburbs. The son would like to spend the money and invest it in a liquor store because that would give a long-term source of income. The problem is the son lost his investment. So when the rest of the money was used to help mama move into the suburbs, the neighbors tried to buy uh, the son out and the son needed the money because he lost his investment. Well, the movie ends with he decides to uh, figure out how to deal with his loss and let his mother move into the neighborhood. So the movie ends on a happy note, but one wonders what might have happened next, given the violent response that the neighborhood historically would have uh, mounted. So the title of the film comes from a Langston Hughes poem, What Happens to a Dream Deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? So add to this uh, government-sanctioned discrimination. Federal Housing Authority denied mortgages to Black Americans and those who lived in mixed-race neighborhoods. Black residents had to buy lease-to-buy contracts. They couldn't get a mortgage. So notice in our story of uh, the day camp at, at Lake Quanapog, the Black Consortium could not get a mortgage. They couldn't buy Dunwoody out outright. They had to take a lease. And rather than a lease from the bank, they took the lease from Dunwoody himself. Now, the problem um, with these lease-to-buy contracts is that if you miss a payment, you can be foreclosed on. And all the money that you've paid is lost. You have to live out the entire contract to uh, to own the home and not lose any money. The problems with this kind of uh, leasing is that if someone couldn't afford the house, the house would fall into disrepair. They would have to make more make the uh, lease payment, and so necessary maintenance was ignored. And Families would uh, take in uh, boarders. The house might become a two-family or a three-family house so that more people were, con were contributing to the rent, but this couldn't uh, be sustainable. Realtors would foreclose. They would resell the houses at above market rates without making any improvements and, and so on. So there was a, a continual decline of the uh, value of the houses, and eventually the houses were raised, giving rise to urban blight. Blockbusting was another technique. Realtors uh, would convince white residents that black families are moving into their neighborhood. They would buy those properties at below market rates, and they would sell to black families at above market rates. And uh, we would go back to the cycle of the lease to buy contracts and the houses falling in more and more into disrepair. Realtors would convince residents of black neighborhoods that their homes have low value and they would buy the houses at discounted prices. But the realtors knew the value of these homes and they would make a large profit by selling the properties to developers for gentrification of the neighborhood. And the uh, remaining residents uh, would be pushed out and the, and the neighborhood taken over by the wealthy. Redlining um, was another uh, uh, technique where the banks would decide where, where they would be willing to uh, uh, give a mortgage. And there are long-term effects to this. Redlining has largely been eliminated, but the effects of redlining are still here. This affects middle-class Americans who can only find housing in the old red or orange uh, zoned areas. The Richmond uh, study shows a correlation between the, uh, the red line districts and current day heat maps. Now the notion here is that poor neighborhoods have a lot of asphalt, not a lot of trees. And so those neighborhoods are noticeably hotter than the tree-lined uh, neighborhoods of the uh, suburbs. So here we show um, redlining in the 30s. Here's the heat map of today. 
And so if you compare this area here to this area here, or this red line districts here to this heat map here and so on, you can see there's a pretty good correlation. So confining black Americans to these neighborhoods and their neighborhoods that they couldn't get out of. So we need to explore that and unpack that a little more. Here's a similar study done in California. The um, urban neighborhood is a dangerous neighborhood. It's full of pollutants and gives rise to a lot of asthma. So we could map who comes to the emergency room uh, with a, an asthma attack and compare that to uh, redlined areas. So uh, here in San Francisco, for example, here's the distribution where do uh, residents live who have asthma. And up here, we have uh, the red line zones. You can see the red and orange, the yellow neighborhoods. And again, here in San Diego, compare here to here. And in Los Angeles, compare here uh, to here. So again, it's showing that redlining, even though it's not done anymore, the effects of redlining still exist today. Today, Connecticut is the wealthiest state per capita in the nation, but it's the, the most segregated outside the South. It's also the most unequal state and outside the South. Now, in the next couple of slides, I'm going to throw a lot of numbers at you, but I don't want you to uh, perseverate on them, uh, just to get a general sense of the situation. So the top 1% of earners in Connecticut earn 51 times the amount of the bottom 1%. There's also a gap in ownership. White citizens are twice as likely to own a home as black citizens. CT is dead last in housing permits due to uh, one acre plus zoning for single family homes. The map on uh, your right shows in blue those regions that are zoned for one acre or more housing. This map was generated by the organization Desegregate CT. And if you go to their website, uh, you'll find this is an interactive map and you can learn about the situation in your own neighborhood. So if 95% of the uh, residential uh, land is uh, slated for one acre plus uh, zoning, this creates a problem. Because for every 100 low income renters, there are only 40 affordable and available housing units. The lack of affordable housing units causes young adults and seniors to leave the state. Uh, your elderly relatives live in a large house on a large property and all the family is uh, all the children have moved out of the house uh, onto their lives and they'd like to downsize and find an affordable place to live and they can't do it because of this profound housing shortage. And the same for uh, youth that grew up in Connecticut and would like to stay in Connecticut to start their careers and, and start their families, uh, and they can't do it. They have to live the, leave the state because uh, it's hard to find a place to afford here. This also creates a problem in towns uh, where uh, workers like police and fire and teachers and so forth can't afford to live in the town that they work in. It also inhibits black and other minority families from leaving the inner city. So in a sense, this is uh, de jure rather than de facto segregation. Uh, Chief Justice Roberts of the Supreme Court said, well, black uh, families are concentrated in the inner city because that's where they wanna live. We'll explore why is it that they can't move out of that city. So let's expand that map to look at uh, the situation along the shoreline. And I'm going to compare uh, three towns. Uh, we have Brantford, Guilford, and Madison. Guilford has 90% of the area zoned for housing uh, that satisfies the filtering criteria. The filtering, filtering criteria are one acre or more per house. You can see that the uh, Household income is, on average is $110,000. Uh, about 12% of the population are uh, minorities, and 30% are cost burden, 
cost burden means you spend more than 30% uh, of your income on rent or mortgage plus utilities. If we compare that to Madison, Madison uh, is similar in terms of income, somewhat less uh, minorities, and slightly more of their residential areas are zoned for one acre found, uh, families. And a similar amount, 31%, are cost burdened. If we go on and look at Brantford, we see that uh, uh, a lot more, a lot less of their land is uh, uh, for one acre or more zoning. That means the density of housing in Brantford is uh, more. The household income is less. The number of minorities is somewhat higher. And the number that are cost burdened are 40% of the population. So let's unpack uh, um, these facts and understand that generational wealth accumulates primarily through home ownership. But the explicit racism for most of the 20th century that we've just discussed a, a slide or two ago uh, prevented Black Americans from accumulating wealth as quickly as white Americans. The wealth disparities were uh, established prior to the 1960s, and they were perpetuated despite the civil rights movement. Recall the heat maps and asthma maps that we just discussed. The effects remained from government sanctioned redlining, predatory realtors, and the GI Bill. Zoning became, and still is a major tool for maintaining segregation. Now, we might not think of us as racist today, but the system is designed uh, to effectively be racist, have a racist outcome. We refer to this as systemic racism. And it raises the question, do those of us who benefited from white privilege have a responsibility to use their wealth and power to undo the status quo? So let's look at some of the factors that affect uh, the accumulation of wealth. First, there are health disparities. The inner city is a toxic environment. There's increased asthma, fewer groceries and parks, uh, increased violence. And it's been demonstrated uh, by uh, reports, uh, research published in uh, public health uh, journals that mental health improves when you move to the suburbs. There are disparities in education, and these stem from the health disparities. So consider a child with asthma who can't get a good night's sleep. Therefore, it's hard to stay awake in class and focus on the lessons. Such a child might even act out and uh, be regarded as a problem child. Mental health plays an important factor. Um, and it's been shown that if you move into more secure housing, so-called Section 8 housing in the city, uh, stress is a little better, mental health uh, improves somewhat, but a move to the suburbs has a profound effect both on uh, parents and small children. With much better health uh, comes the uh, ability to be a better student in school. Now, the other issue here is uh, most schools are funded by property taxes. And so if you live in a wealthy neighborhood, uh, your property is expensive. And so tax on your uh, property yields a large amount of money. The mill rate or tax rate can be very low and you have adequate money for a, a well-funded school. But if you live in the inner city, property values are low. Even if you live in a, uh, a middle-class black neighborhood, property values are still low. So you have to raise the mill rate. You have to have uh, more expensive taxes in order to raise more money uh, to fund the schools and so many other services that the town provides. But you can never raise the mill rate high enough to generate the kind of income that a wealthy neighborhood could generate. So you still have underfunded schools. Therefore, it's a double whammy. It's more expensive to live there and you get less bang for the buck for your money. And then there are incarceration disparities. Black youth are more likely than white youth to get 
uh, mixed up in the criminal justice system. And the war on drugs is a good example of the unfairness of this. Crack cocaine is predominantly found in the inner cities, where powdered cocaine is traditionally found in the suburbs. So a white child in the suburbs uh, gets caught with uh, cocaine and uh, probably will get a slap on the wrist, a very light sentence. But for a black youth who um, is found with crack cocaine, this is a big problem because crack cocaine is penalized far harsher than powdered cocaine, even though medically they're both the same. There's no physiologic difference between the two forms of uh, cocaine. And so the black youth are charged with a felon. And once you become a felon, your life has a very poor prospect because once you get out of jail, you can't get a job because you have to check that box that says, were you ever a felon? And you can't move back with your family because if they're on public support of any sort, uh, food stamps, for example, uh, or housing benefits, that uh, uh, once you move back in the household, the family will lose those benefits. If you're on your own, you can't get those benefits. And so you end up with uh, single parent homes. You end up with people on the street that can't get work. And it's no wonder that many of them will return to a, a life of crime or will begin a life of crime and be back in jail. So it'll be a revolving door uh, created by the system that was initiated by this unfair uh, consequence of the war on drugs. And I view this as the cost of racism. We have wasted the potential of inner city youth. They are bit by bit as intelligent and have as much potential as a white youth. But instead of going on to become taxpayers and contributors to the economy, they end up draining social services, one to pay for the prisons, but also since they can't realize their potential, they end up dependent on uh, welfare uh, type services. Now the Fair Housing Act was supposed to fix this, but the Fair Housing Act is addressing the Northern version of segregation. And uh, Northerners were happy to pass anti-segregation laws if they affected primarily the South. But now to gain Northern support, we had to make the bill uh, toothless. So discrimination still exists. I can give an example from a personal experience. A mixed race couple that I know uh, had a hard time finding a, a place to live. Uh, realtors would find ways to uh, discourage them. Oh, the house is no longer on the market uh, or some such excuse. And it was all because uh, my friend's husband was black skinned. And there's a, a, an implicit bias. White customers shun middle and upper class neighborhoods with black residents. Market forces lead to depressed property values in integrated or black neighborhoods. So if you have a neighborhood with people with comparable incomes to a, a white neighborhood, those property values are depressed. And if it's depressed, one, it, uh, the neighborhood attracts black customers are of modest means, but with a house with low property values, the accumulation of wealth is slowed. So to summarize part A, Racism inherent in redlining, the New Deal, and the GI Bill led to segregated communities in Connecticut. One acre or more per home zoning established and maintains segregation to this day. And consequently, Black Americans were unable to accumulate generational wealth as quickly as white Americans. In part B, I will tell a similar story about access to the Connecticut beaches and offer actions that we can take. I look forward to seeing you next time. I would like to thank Dennis Culleton from the Witness Stone Project, Joel Halander, Guilford Town Historian, Errol Davis of the African American Heritage House in Chautauqua, New York, 
and Camille Borders, Princeton University and the African American Heritage House for their helpful discussions. Carol Rizzolo provided help and encouragement. Edwin Williams and Charla Nietzsche provided stories about New Haven's Dixwell and New Hallville neighborhoods. Special thanks to Tracy Tomaselli, in the historical room, the Guilford Free Library, who provided research materials and helpful suggestions. Please feel free to contact me at larry.rizzolo at gmail.com.